logical place to start is during the lame duck session last year, uh, when Congress actually did come quite close to passing a cyber info sharing measure. Uh, what essentially happened was you had a main bill in the House uh, known as CISPA and a bill over in the Senate known as CISA. And we were trying to move both of those at once in Congress. And it kind of got tied up with the issues around NSA surveillance reform. Uh, most of you probably remember the USA Freedom Act and how that came to a uh, glorious end on the Senate floor after hours of heated debate late at night. And the consensus was that once that failed uh, to move forward in the Senate, it also kind of killed the chances at cyber info sharing legislation. The idea being, uh, there were some privacy concerns with cyber info sharing legislation, that that would just give the NSA and intelligence agencies another platform, another outlet through which to collect personal data on Americans. Uh, so people from uh, privacy groups to the White House to some major Senate Democrats and House Democrats were urging move on a USA Freedom type bill before moving on a cybersecurity bill. Uh, so those two issues really got tied up during the lame duck session and everything did not move forward. Uh, coming back in 2015, lawmakers saw this opening to work on cybersecurity legislation before NSA surveillance reauthorization uh, came up. Um, as many of you may know, uh, the Section 215 authority, which authorizes some of the more controversial programs is up June 1st and has to be reauthorized. In May, the Senate is going to start, and the House is going to start talking a lot about those issues. And there was this window where lawmakers thought they could move with cyber bills before the issues of NSA uh, clouded uh, and got tied together with cybersecurity. So what they decided to do on the House side was move forward with two complementary bills. There was new leadership in the House Intelligence Committee, uh, Devin Nunes and uh, Adam Schiff, and uh, with Mike Rogers retiring, and they decided to move with House Homeland, move two complementary bills, design them so they could be combined at the end, and move them on similar timelines. Uh, that has, to this point, has happened. The House Intel bill has passed out of the committee. The House Homeland bill is set for a markup uh, next week, I believe on the 14th. Um, and those are designed, they do not overlap really in many ways. They were designed to be combined and uh, from talking to people, uh, their hope is to combine them and then send one bill to the floor, essentially free conference then. Um, so that's what's been happening on the House side. On the Senate side, uh, there was obviously new leadership there, but Feinstein remained as the ranking member. Uh, it was her bill and Saxby Chambliss's bill last year, and they took many components of that and tried to take a lot of that language, use it as the base of the 2015 version of CISA. They have also, though, incorporated many other elements uh, in an attempt to woo certain Senate Democrats, to woo privacy advocates. Uh, the White House, several months ago, actually put forward their own legislative proposal on cybersecurity info sharing. Uh, it was seen as a bit more acceptable to privacy advocates. It put the Department of Homeland Security at the center of all cyber threat data exchanges, uh, and that's been kind of one of the key components of disagreement, has been which agencies companies should share information what venue, what portal should they go through? Uh, and at this point, the Senate Intel Bill and most lawmakers have coalesced around this idea that the White House put forth that the Department of Homeland Security, a civilian agency, should be the initial portal that companies go through when sharing data with the government. The idea being that a civilian agency has better privacy oversight, better transparency than some of the intelligence agencies. Uh, so Senate Intel moved on a bill which heavily encourages, although does still allow or would allow some uh, information to go directly to intelligence agencies. Um, they moved forward with that bill and that has passed out of committee. And the thought is they want to get it to the floor um, sometime in the coming weeks, although the Senate does not have as strict a timeline from what I know as the House does. The House is planning to get these bills on the floor between April 21st and April 23rd. On the Senate side, uh, as you guys probably know, it's a little more kind of touchy-feely, and we'll see how it goes. Um, essentially, the main goal of these bills is to provide companies with legal liability protections when sharing data with the government. Right now, companies say that they're hesitant to share information with the government, cybersecurity information with the government, uh, because they're afraid of shareholder lawsuits, regulatory action, um, and so that is the key component of these bills and what they would attempt to do. Uh, so with that, 
Uh, that's kind of how we got to where we are today. I figured I'd kick it over to our panelists, and uh, if everyone maybe could start a bit with uh, not only who you are and what your background is, but um, kind of where you stand on these bills, what you see as the pros and cons, and the points uh, that we should be looking to uh, when we're trying to decide how are these going to move forward, what are they going to be the key aspects to pay attention to. Um, so, Robin, I'll start with you. Hi, my name is Robin Green. I'm a policy counsel with New America's Open Technology Institute. Um, thank you guys so much for taking the time to come listen to what we have to say today. I'm very busy running up to the next work session. Um, if you'd like to find more information about OTI's work on cybersecurity, you can go to www.newamerica.org slash OTI. Just Google my name or search my name and cybersecurity. Um, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about the two intelligence committee proposals um, because they are built on the same framework. Uh, as Corey mentioned, the House of Homeland Security Committee is also working on a proposal, but as it's only the discussion draft that has been made publicly available and that we expect that to change during markup, um, I think it would make more sense to focus on the two proposals that have uh, been more solidified. So with regard to the Protecting Cyber Networks Act, the PCNA, which is the House Intelligence Committee's bill, um, it, it poses really significant concerns with regard to privacy and civil liberties. Uh, so I'm just going to break down sort of the primary concerns that we have, and then I'll illustrate what the differences are with CISA, though many of those uh, concerns are aligned. So first, uh, PCNA includes an overbroad authorization for sharing. Um, its authorization is notwithstanding any other provision of law. It's important to understand that companies are already authorized to share cyber threat information under law, uh, with the government, and so there are some concerns with regard to the liability protections associated with that sharing, but what you do when you say you're authorized to share notwithstanding any other provision of law is you allow sharing uh, regardless of any of the privacy laws that might have otherwise protected Americans' personal information. So that's hugely concerning. The second concern is with regard to the kind of information that the legislation would authorize companies to share with the government. So this is concerning because cyber threat indicator is defined broadly. Uh, it would allow sharing not only of certain technical data that reasonably should be shared uh, with the government and with other companies to prevent or uh, identify threats, but it would also include non-technical data, um, data that describes attributes of threats, which could include personal and identifiable information. Um, this could be the type of thing that is not only that malicious IP address, that's associated with the threat, but perhaps also the user identity of the person to whom that IP address is assigned, uh, their internet use activity information. So that would be concerning in and of itself. Beyond that though, once the information is shared with the government, it's authorized to be used by the federal government for a wide array of purposes that have nothing to do with cybersecurity. Uh, these purposes include the investigation of uh, serious violent crimes, of imminent, uh, of, excuse me, not imminent, just any threat of death or serious bodily harm, um, and a, a host of other uh, violations of things like the Espionage Act and ID uh, and uh, trade secret theft violations. Of course, many of these crimes are terrible, uh, and we would want law enforcement to investigate them pursuant to their current reasonable authorities. Uh, but once you start authorizing information to be voluntarily shared with the government in large scale, as may happen once this uh, bill passes, and then authorize the government to use it for purposes that are entirely outside the scope of cybersecurity, it really transforms the nature of the bill. It undermines what would otherwise be privacy protections and due process protections that Americans would be entitled to with regard to how the government accesses and uses their information and creates an entirely new framework for the government to obtain Americans' information and then investigate their activities. Um, the one distinction here is uh, where the, um, excuse me, where the PCNA does not require um, imminence for any type of threat. CISA does require imminence for some of the crimes, but that's undermined because there are other violent crimes that don't require imminence. Um, and so this could allow law enforcement to collect cyber threat indicators, which may include personal information, and sort of just mine through them in order to identify evidence of those crimes and then pursue further investigation of them. And that's, again, absent traditional privacy and due process protections. Um, 
The last thing that's of great concern with regard to the privacy impact these bills could have is the requirement to remove personal information. Uh, PCNA does have a stronger requirement to remove personal information than CISA does. Um, and it was uh, a very positive improvement in the markup. It requires information, uh, companies to make reasonable efforts to remove information they reasonably believe to be not directed to uh, the cybersecurity threat. So this is positive in that uh, it's a stronger <coughs> standard than CISA, but it would still allow for uh, personal information that's not necessary to identify or respond to the threat to be shared with the government um, it would also then require any entity in government that receives that information to automatically disseminate it to the NSA. And then again, all of that information could be used for all of the authorized purposes, which do go far outside of the scope of cyber purposes. Hi, um, I'm Dina Graziano. I'm the Director of Federal Government Affairs at Symantec. Um, I've been here for about five years prior to that. I served 15 years on um, the House and the Senate at the Homeland Security Committee and the Judiciary Committee. So I'm uh, very familiar with many of your challenges you're facing when reviewing a lot of these different pieces of legislation and all the intricacies that go with them. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Symantec, we are the largest security software company in the world. We have about 21,000 employees globally, and for those who don't know Symantec, you may know our consumer brand, Norton, and I hope you're all using that on all of your devices today. <laughs> um, Symantec has long been interested in the information sharing debate. Um, I'd like to dispel one myth that people are talking about today. Um, information sharing is not a panacea. It is not going to solve or address every threat that we're seeing in today's threat landscape. It is just one tool in the toolbox that we need to improve upon. Uh, companies like mine have been sharing for years under uh, different agreements. Um, this bill would actually provide a different type of liability for, for that type of sharing that is currently going on today. Um, we have been reviewing all of these different pieces of legislation very carefully and have not taken a position on any of them at this point. Uh, but one clear principle that we need to see in any piece of legislation is that um, any new voluntary program that is stood up, um, we feel that private sector, the private sector should have to share through a civilian agency. Whether that's DHS, whether that's Commerce, pick your poison, we don't have a dog in that fight. Um, and the reason we feel this way is our primary goal as a company is to protect your information as our customers. And we feel that these, these civilian-facing organizations have better privacy protections in place to ensure that your data is secure when sharing beyond um, and within the government. Um, as far as other issues that we've seen in these bills, minimization is another key portion of any bill that we need to see. Um, as stated before, um, companies like mine are not sharing PII. We are minimizing your data before sharing anything forward. Most of the time, we're not looking at PII, we're looking at signatures, we're looking at packets, we're, we're looking at, I'm gonna quote um, Heather, ones and zeros um, <laughs> from years ago, and this is the debate. So um, yes, there are times where um, there's an additional scrubbing needed for PII, but for most of the time, um, that is not what's being shared, and there's really no interest or no use to be sharing PII. Um, so I just would like to add that as another one of the points that we um, need to see. And, and finally, I would say in any bill, uh, the scope of sharing and the use for sharing is the most important. We feel that, again, cybersecurity purpose should be defined very narrowly. Um, in many of the pieces of legislation we're seeing today, it's a bit broader. Um, some are citing WMD, some are citing terrorism, and other uses. Um, we would like to see a narrow use for cybersecurity. Um, minus FISA reform, many of our companies are still facing very big challenges abroad in the post Snowden world. We're trying to restore the trust of our customers. Um, I'd say Symantec would have preferred uh, the sequencing of these bills be a little different and that we had already addressed FISA and some of the reforms necessary to restore that trust. Um, but absent FISA, I think we really need to take a very, very narrow approach to information sharing moving forward. Hello everyone, good afternoon. I am Heather Malio and I uh, work for Cornerstone Government Affairs, which is uh, just down the road here. We do cyberspace defense and all sorts of other policy, but that's not the reason.
them on the phone, to raise them on the panel, is I was the staff director for the House Intelligence Committee last term with uh, Ranking Member Rupert and Chairman Rogers, and we were the authors of CISPA. CISPA was something that we, Ranking Member and the Chairman got together four years ago and said to companies, okay, what, what do you guys need? We're seeing people getting hammered out there. I mean, since the last four years have gotten even worse with the Sony attack, which debilitated all these computers, with the Target attacks, with JP Morgan shutting down banking systems and stuff like that. We went to the companies and said, what do you guys need to, to shore up your defenses? And what they said to us was, we know the government and other companies have really good information of attacks before they get to us. Maybe they've seen it, maybe they've been hit by it. We want to be able to share that information, but we don't know legally if we're allowed to do that. They said some GC, some general counsel say it's fine, some don't, it depends if you trust the person, if you're not. There's all this sort of legal wishy-washy. Can you guys help us get through that? So we sat down with a bunch of companies and with the intelligence community and said, how do we do this? How do we share this information in a way that protects privacy and protects personal information, but also gives companies the info they need to, to shore up their systems? And we came up with CISPA. We started four years ago. We were the first bill out of the gate. We learned a lot. We made lots of changes. We started one place and kept moving and made more and more privacy protections as we went along the way. One of the biggest things, which folks have mentioned today, is the last round of CISPA ended up adding the DHS portal, which made the Department of Homeland Security a civilian organization the portal to encourage companies to go through when they interface with the government. We did lots of different things, and I want to be in that fight because CISPA has, is still out there and was introduced, but now we are dealing with CISA and the Pixie Cyber Bill, which you had a good acronym for. And PICNA. PICNA. <laughs> um, I, was on the, I was on the committee until about a month ago, and I kind of helped them a lot with it. I think the biggest things I see which are really strong improvements from CISPA, because this hasn't been an evolution from CISPA to now. Now, all of the proposals out there require the companies to scrub the personal information before it's given to the government. Mm -hmm. That's a really good improvement. That was something with CISPA, we were the first out of the gate. We talked to companies, they weren't sure they could do that. They evolved and said, you know, we can. We can do it in a way. It's a man tech and others. We're, they're going to scrub the personal information before they get that. There's also been tighter liability protections for to, you know, to go into a civilian agency. The big thing is that the HIPC cyber bill says you can interface with any civilian agency as long as it's not DOD or NSA, and you get liability protection. CISA is a little different. There's lots of small nuances that are important, but I think there's been quite an evolution of cybersecurity legislation. And the biggest thing is, I sat on the committee for four years and sat through the classified briefs of all these debilitating attacks, starting with Saudi Aramco overseas and then Sony. We need to do something and we need to act. We need to give the companies the information they need to protect themselves. Because if not, we're going to keep having these hacks and more and more personal information is going to be out there because of the attacks. We need to prevent it beforehand. At this point, I no longer work in the hill, so I don't have a job in the fight either. I sort of I help share information, share information with different companies that I work with. Thanks, Heather. Uh, you addressed, which I was hoping you would, some of the differences between CISPA last year and the House Intel Bill this year. Um, I was hoping you could also talk a bit too. So lawmakers, uh, Rogers and Rupert Berger, and now Nunes and Schiff, have argued that NSA surveillance and these House Intel bills are apples and oranges. Can you talk a bit about why they make that point and exactly why they see them as separate, why you might see them as separate, but why other people don't, and how the bills uh, from CISA to now are addressing concerns about, about them being combined issues? So they, they yeah. are very different issues. The biggest thing, and Dean used my term from last um, years ago, uh, the information that's, that is shared through a cybersecurity bill is really ones and zeros. It's technical information, it's signatures, it's different information that helps define a threat. It's not, 
personal information. Now anything, personal information not associated with a threat must be removed with the HIPC cyber bill. Because that's not what the, the government's looking for. They don't care about that. that that's not going to help them protect the next threat. If they, the reason we got into the uses, to get into what Robin was saying, what if there was a kidnapper who embedded something in a piece of information, it went to the FBI, and it was an imminent death to a toddler, and you couldn't use that information because we prevented it. What would we do then? Allow the toddler to be kidnapped and not try to save them? That was why we got into that use discussion. But that 99.9% .9 of the time, that information is not going to be shared. That's going to have nothing to do with it. But we didn't want to tie the hands. And CISA and, and the HIPC cyber bill do things very differently. CISA is a little broader with weapons of mass destruction and a little more counterterrorism. The HIPC cyber bill is very tightly defined for its, its bodily injury, child endangerment, and some other tighter uses. And, and that's something that the House and the Senate are going to have to decide as to what they think is right. Robin, I imagine that you might have uh, some some points to make uh, after that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I want to just touch on a few of the, the things that were raised uh, just now. First, uh, with regard to the uses, um, I think that it's important to note that the uses that are being authorized under both bills, CISA and, uh, and the PCNA, are not limited to the instance where a toddler may have been kidnapped. They include very broad uses that require no imminence, that include the investigation of crimes such as carjacking, arson, robbery. And again, these are bad crimes, but these are not crimes that if the bill is so narrowly drafted as to not include personal information, to not include content, to just be those dollar signatures and lending bureaus, there isn't really any conceivable instance in which you would have evidence into a carjacking or an arson. So I think that this highlights two important points. First of all, that the uses under no circumstance should go beyond imminent threat of death or serious bodily harm or threat to a minor, and then of course using it to prevent cyber attacks. That would be reasonable. Um, they should not include any of the other uses that are included in CISA and, CISA, uh, in CISA and the PCNA. Uh, in addition to that, I think this highlights the point that we do need to tighten the requirements to remove personally identifiable information. And we need to narrow the definition for cyber threat indicator so that we can be sure that no such information would be shared. I think it's true that many companies that will be sharing will be acting in good faith and will likely be doing their best to share you know, the ones and zeros, the dollar signatures. But not all companies that share information are going to have the same sophisticated analysts and tech technologists that Symantec has. There will be companies that will be authorized to share tremendous amounts of information about Americans' internet activities that will not have that kind of sophistication. And for that reason, it's important to ensure that Americans' privacy will be protected, particularly because these authorizations are notwithstanding any other provision of law. And if an American is harmed by the sharing of their information or the way that that information is used, the liability protections in the bill are so strong that they have almost no recourse to ensure that their harms are, are redressed. So it's critically important that the provisions of the bill be narrowed so that they can be able to address and only address the valid purposes that Heather just raised. The bill's not their party yet. I would like to chime in Please. on one point. I, I fully agree that the scope of sharing should be very narrow. We are in full agreement, I think, across the table that there are very limited uses for the data. Um, I would take one issue with one point, and that is um, the companies that are sharing, that would be participating in these programs are not sophisticated. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. Obviously, Symantec is, is a different kind of company. Our business is pretty much pure security. But th this bill isn't going to open the floodgates of a whole bunch of new companies with new threat data rushing to share information. Those who are sharing now will continue sharing. There may be a few others that may decide to share, but most people who have threat data to share are already doing it, and they already have these, these policies, procedures, privacy protections in place because 
they understand how to manage personal data. Yes, there may be a few companies that don't have that. Um, and I think some of what the EO is doing, um, the ISAL um, structures are trying to address some of those needs. But um, while I agree that the, the focus should be narrow, I, I don't want to, um, I, I don't want you to think that if we pass a bill like this or any of these bills that tomorrow there is going to be a rush of new threat data that's coming into the ecosystem and there's a whole bunch of new companies that are coming to play in this realm because that is absolutely not the case. Ina, you mentioned uh, ISAs and ISACs. Uh, for those of us not yeah, in the know of these acronyms, would you mind uh, explaining oh, um, very briefly what exactly yes, these are? Yes, um, they're, they're sharing and analysis centers and organizations. Um, and those are how many industries share today. Um, they are stood up, they're separate, and uh, we have a financial services ISAC, there's a technology ISAC. There's several different ways companies like mine share information, um, both with other companies and with the government today. So one thing the president has done is create a new, a new category, which is an ISAL, and it's the Information Sharing Analysis Organization. Um, and that's just another way that companies who want to share can create their own structure to share and receive protections under the executive order. Um, Symantec and Fortinet and Palo Alto Networks, McAfee Intel, um, have actually stood up our own ISAL. Um, it's called the Cyber Threat Alliance. Um, it basically shows that companies that are competitors can share in real time with each other, protect personal data, and try to secure the ecosystem together. And that executive order was the one that Obama signed at the Stanford summit in such kind of uh, public fashion. Um, so we talked a, a good deal about information sharing between the private sector and the government. Another point of contention has been information sharing within the government. What happens to that data once it gets to DHS, once it gets to commerce? Where is it going? What do those agencies have to do with the data before they share it with other agencies? Um, so I was hoping you guys could weigh in a bit on that issue and how you see the data being shared and what you see as the provisions to further scrub personal data before it is shared and whether you think those are uh, significant and robust enough. Um, and I'll let you guys kind of jump in on that. Um, so at OTI we've taken um, a pretty uh, outspoken position um, that we have serious concerns about the manner in which the framework was set up. Uh, it's important that there be civilian control of any new information sharing program um, that's authorized under this kind of legislation. And we don't feel that any of the bills, um, at least proposed by the intelligence committees thus far, have effectively done that. The reason is it's not a question of only uh, whether you can share directly with the NSA um, or with DOD. It's a question of what happens to the information after it's shared. Uh, if you are sharing with a civilian entity who, as under CISA and the PCNA, would be required to automatically, um, in real time, disseminate every piece of threat data that they receive uh, through this authorization to the NSA and to DOD, uh, then that's really a distinction without a difference. We're not really ensuring civilian control of this program. We're creating a door, and then the moment that information goes through the door, it can access the whole house, um, including military entities. So the key here is ensuring that whichever entity receives it, if it's DHS or another civilian entity, ensuring that that entity has the discretion to determine when, how, and with whom that, that information is shared. Um, this uh, will happen in several ways. One, just through <coughs> determining whether something really does rise to the level of being a significant threat, because there are some threats that they uh, may need to have information about. Um, but it's also important to ensure that before any of that sharing happens, that as Corey mentioned, there be a second sort of privacy suite. There is that second scrub to ensure that any PII wasn't improperly shared, um, and even further to ensure that PII isn't unnecessarily disseminated. Uh, throughout the government, because it could be that PII is shared and it's not shared improperly, but that's it's still not necessary to identify or respond to the threat, and thus doesn't need to be further disseminated um, past that initial share. I think that uh, both PCNA and CISA need to be strengthened in those respects. As I said, I did not offer those. 
those two bills, so I've read them, <laughs> having had a little knowledge of how this works. The thought is behind both of them, and I spoke to the councils who actually did draft the bill in the last couple of days. Um, their thought is to have the uh, guidelines, privacy, additional privacy guidelines, once whatever entity first gets the information to do the second scrub that you're talking about, and then get it, and then share it with the other around the government. The thought being, do you not want to give it to the military if it's important threat data so that you can protect government, I mean, military networks? Do you want them getting our secrets on how we build our different bombers or secure information? Do you want to be able to protect that? But I think the feeling is, having talked to both councils who drafted these bills, they don't want personal information going to these organizations. That's not what they want to do, but their feeling is, if there's important threat data, ones and zeros again, that can help protect a military network or an overseas network, or why wouldn't you give it to them? Yeah, I think our biggest concern is actually with regard to whether it's personal, uh, personally identifiable information that gets disseminated uh, throughout the rest of government. And so many of you saw I actually provided some materials where we sort of lay out OTI's position on that. But the key here is it has to be more clear in both, uh, both bills that the policies and procedures will, will have two things happen. One, they'll be promulgated before information sharing starts. That's not clear in the bill. And so it's concerning that information sharing could start and these systems could be set up that maybe don't protect privacy as well as they should. Um, and then it, you'd have to apply privacy procedures on top of these you know, already ongoing practices. The second problem is the bill explicitly states, both bills explicitly state, that the privacy policies and procedures may not be written in such a way that would uh, inhibit the automatic dissemination, that would delay the dissemination of cyber threat indicators, um, or that would modify those cyber threat indicators um, during their dissemination. And so it's unclear as to whether you would be able to <coughs> go through that second privacy scrub and remove that personal information. If it was the intent in the bill, um, then I think we just need to go back to the drafting table and make that a little more clear. Um, I, I agree with what both of you are saying. Um, and again, sharing a PII is a very rare occurrence. Um, it, it is not the norm, so I, I, while very, very important and a core business issue for us, it is, um, it's a rare case that PII would be shared. Um, that is why we are we're working with both drafters, all drafters at this time, to ensure that there is some type of secondary scrub, whether that be through the NCIC or through another, through another agency. It's, um, we feel that it is our responsibility to protect your data. We need to push through, and any, any real-time information sharing should be going through a civilian agency that already has privacy uh, safeguards in place. If we look at DHS, they have done a great job at protecting information, providing good transparency on their privacy protocols, whether that's the agency of choice, again, not not our, uh, not our doesn't, doesn't matter to us. Um, but again, very rare occurrence, ones and zeros, signatures, um, but in that rare case, we do feel that uh, privacy protection should be baked in to any bill from the beginning and not bolted on later on, because again, that's where uh, challenges can occur. I guess one thing I... No, go ahead. <laughs> I'll get it wrong. It's the end of yeah. the National Cyber oh, the NCAA. Security Communication and Integration NCAA. Center at DHS. Yeah. <laughs> so when you talk about the NCAA, it's the floor in Arlington where they where receive all the information and they would disseminate it for the rest of the government if that was the organization of choice. It looks pretty cool, actually. It's, it literally it's is cool. a floor where people sit there with all these screens. Anyway, it's kind of <laughs> neat. Um, one thing I wanted to, to get at as well is kind of, we're sitting here talking about some of the privacy concerns, some of the reasons those have been mitigated in bills uh, from some, people, some people's perspective. There is a chance that these bills get to the floor and pass without all of these issues being addressed. Do they need to be fully addressed for the bills to pass? Can these bills actually get through Congress and get to the President's desk uh, without addressing all of these concerns in the past? We've seen the White House uh, issued a veto threat for CISPA last year. Um, we saw key Senate Democrats also be against that. A lot of people have come around. The White House has been 
relatively public that they think there is a way to work forward, you know, not an official endorsement, but a way to work forward with all of these bills that are out there right now. Um, and some Senate Democrats, some House Democrats, uh, including Adam Schiff, uh, are now in favor of these bills, and they were not last year. So do we need the full support of the privacy community to get these bills through, or is there a chance they pass uh, without that, with those issues still on the table? Um, I, I'll take a quick pass at that. Um, I think it's very clear the White House has pushed the civilian need for information sharing for the past four, four years. Um, they issued a veto threat um, last time around. Obviously, I don't speak for the White House, but I think it's very clear that the White House will not accept a bill that allows or any new information sharing program to be stood up and companies to receive liability protection for any sharing other than directly through that civilian portal initially. So I think um, what we are seeing in some of the um, the, the other drafts, um, again, I think they may need um, to tweak a bit, but again, not speaking for the White House. I think there's also challenges on both sides of the aisle. Um, there are many Republicans who feel that some of these bills go too far, that they resemble a surveillance bill. Um, you know, obviously everyone is entitled to their opinion, but I think if our goal in the end is to protect privacy and security because they are not mutually exclusive, um, these bills have to drive through, any, any program has to drive through a civilian agency, have strong minimization requirements um, in order for them to get through the president's desk. But again, um, the privacy community has done a great job. In my opinion, they've worked very well with um, all of the committees that have legislation. Um, this is, a, this is a group effort. There's no one at this table, no matter who you represent, that doesn't want to see the, the ecosystem more secure, and there is a way to get there. And I think the, starting from CISPA, because that's of course where I started, the, we have come such a long way. There's more way to go, absolutely. And I bet my bottom dollar, this goes to the floor, you're gonna have a lot of privacy amendments, as you should, your bosses should do that. If they think something's critically important, put it forward, get it out there, get it, you know, get it through rules, get it on the floor. I think there's gonna, we always thought when I started CISPA four years ago, it was an evolutionary process, and we've gotten better and better protections as you go along the way. The other thing that's in both of these bills as well are attorney general approved guidelines, which gives the administration, after they get the bill, say it passes, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> say it passes, they can say, you know what, this is how we're gonna do it, and we're gonna write the regulations this way to impose additional privacy protections. There's so many layers that it can continually be increased, and just because it turns into law doesn't mean that it can't be changed, because the administration writes the regulations and guidelines. That's how we wrote CISPA, and that's how PCNA, at this time, and CISA do the same thing. They allow the administration to have a say. They're the ones that are gonna to have to enforce this. And I think even further, uh, the companies who do want this, they want it done right. It doesn't help any of our companies to go to our European partners and explain to them that we are sharing with intelligence and, and the IC community. That doesn't help our business. That's not what we want to do. Everyone, again, is trying to restore trust and secure the ecosystem at the same time. And there is a balance that can be struck to do that. So I don't want to, everyone to think that we just want to, most companies just want to push this through to push it through to get liability. That's not the case. For most of them are publicly traded global companies that really have an interest in securing their customer data. So the goal really is to find the sweet spot and, and secure the ecosystem. Uh, Richard Burr, after they passed uh, the bill out of committee, oh, this is about a month ago now, um, he said he felt he had been stretched so far in privacy that he felt like he had had plastic surgery during the process. Um, his, that's how he puts it. Uh, anyway, I was hoping to open it up to the audience to see if you guys have any questions, um, anything you'd like to pose to the panelists, so I will go ahead and open it up. If you've scrubbed everything of personal identifiable information, how do you know you've got some sort of a threat information in there? I mean, that, that somebody's planning to kidnap somebody else or, or do bodily harm. Well, mo most companies aren't looking for that. They're looking right. for malware signatures. Right, but we've got an exception in the, the bills for mm -hmm. some sort of evil doing. I mean, how does anybody know that, that, that A sent to B uh, an email saying we're going to kidnap so-and-so 
Friday at nine. But we're not sharing emails. And I think that's something that we have to clarify. Semantic isn't sharing your emails with anyone to prevent threats. That's not, I mean, unless there's some, you know, spam or something like that, but that's not what we're sharing. That's not even, we're not even looking at your emails for the most part, so. Yeah, I guess I'm getting to the question of why, is, what sort of information would be uncovered in any of this uh, monitoring that could then be tied back to a specific crime? Um, I think that that gets actually to the point that I was trying to make. It's not clear why these use authorizations would be necessary if the authorization for sharing is as narrow as it should be. Um, and so we really do need to jettison these use authorizations. It's not even clear that the need for a use authorization for addressing imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury uh, would be all that effective if the definition for cyber threat indicator and the authoriz authorization for sharing were properly narrowed. Um, but then the second part of that is, I think that the fact that those use authorizations are in there reveal that we do still have some work to do to narrow the bill so that it is in fact a cybersecurity bill and not a bill that in effect could have the same impact on Americans' privacy and civil liberties that a surveillance authorization might have. Hi, I'm Joel Mailer. I'm with the Homeland Security Studies and Analysis Institute. We're a federally funded research and development center serving DHS. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak briefly to the topic of countermeasures, uh, perhaps contrasting them with defensive measures, uh, just providing an overview of what's meant by that category of, of activity and how the, how the legislators are going to address them. So um, CISPA had neither countermeasures nor defensive measures. Uh, the, how it's written in these bills is Defensive, the biggest thing is we want to prevent anyone from thinking hacking back was okay. You're not allowed, someone steals your classified whatever and goes, sticks it on their computer system in whatever country, we are not going to leave you and allow you to go in there and grab that back and, and blow up their system. It's, it's not something that this legislation gets into, nor authorizes, nor allows. So we, changed, not we, the, the Senate and the House, which I'm no longer part of, uh, they changed countermeasures, which is what the CISA had last time, to defensive measures, meaning you can protect, you can put a wall out and protect yourself, but you can't go jump into someone else's and blow it up, or even steal back what they stole, because that doesn't, that's not authorized through this legislation. Does that make sense? Probably no defense and privacy concerns there as well. Yeah, well, so they're not exactly privacy The bills have been narrowed significantly, um, both of them, with regard to how they define defensive measures. Some concerns remain, though. Um, I think one of the primary concerns is you're authorizing the use of these defensive measures, notwithstanding any other provision of law, including anti-hacking statutes, such as the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, which would otherwise prohibit gaining unauthorized access of someone else's system. Um, so this is concerning because of two things. First of all, they say you can't do certain harmful things, but what they say is you can't destroy, render unusable, or substantially harm someone else's system. It's not clear how substantially harm will be interpreted, um, and even who will interpret it. Uh, certainly it would be a court at some point if it winds up coming to that point. Um, but it's concerning because you know, if you're creating an authorization to potentially cause harm uh, to someone else's system, and you know, as an everyday American walking down the street, if you are negligent and cause harm to someone else, um, you're not authorized to do that. You would be liable for your negligence. You'd be liable for those harms. And so it's important to ensure that we're not authorizing people to take actions um, that might be causing harm to someone else's system. The other concern is that you are still able to gain unauthorized access uh, to someone else's system, or at least it's not clear that that's prohibited. Um, and so that could result in something such as you uh, inserting um, code into a packet transmitting your network, into information transmitting your network, which is authorized, um, that would take it back to their network, um, and then could perhaps engage in the kind of surveillance that law enforcement would traditionally 
um, have the role in the museum uh, to find out who the person who did Tackle was and what they were looking for and what else they got. Um, and so that would be concerning, uh, not only because we really don't want companies doing that, because law enforcement should be doing that when they're authorized to, um, but in addition to that, because we don't actually know who that person that we would be operating the defensive measure against is. Um, in the world of botnets, um, in the world of foreign nation states attacking, um, we could conceivably be uh, operating a defensive measure against an innocent third party who themselves is the victim of a cyber attack, or perhaps uh, getting ourselves into a bit of a diplomatic kerfuffle um, if it does happen to be a Sony type situation where uh, it is a foreign nation state that's initiated the threat. Anyone else? So we're enabling or in some sense encouraging information sharing, but there's, as you said, you know, it doesn't necessarily mandate it and having shared the information doesn't mean that anybody's going to use it. Um, we can go down on any number of lists of uh, problems and systems. Uh, I'm told that a number of large retailers still are running Windows XP on systems. Uh, you know, we know this is not a good idea, so what could do? I can tell you all the things that are going on, but unless you do something about it, it doesn't help. And, and that's a very fair point. I think, um, and that's why I say that information sharing is just one tool. Um, information sharing is very helpful when, it, when we know that there's an attack, that there's a Home Depot, there's a Michaels, that something's actually happened, we can share that information. However, the bigger issue is the cyber hygiene issue. What are enterprises and governments doing to make sure they have strong patch management, that they don't have 1234 as their default password? There, it's, it's really a constant education campaign, and it, it's in, even encouraging some of these larger enterprises to use the full suite of security software that they're purchasing, because in many instances, they buy, a, they buy a package, they don't turn on all the functionality because they want either their systems to run smoother or faster, or they don't want to open something to the internet. There's a lot of different areas there, and I think that's why information sharing is just one thing we need to do. There's still a whole host of other issues now. I don't want to go into mandating anything, obviously. I think um, you know it's not if, it's when. You're, you're going to be breached, I think, is that the attitude, and I think people need to take a proactive look at their security systems. Don't wait till you've already been penetrated. Don't wait till you've already found out someone's on your system and they're exfiltrating your, your you know, most valuable IP. You know, make sure your, your, your security suite is up to date, that you have the, late, the best and the, the latest and greatest, I should say, and that goes for the government as well. So again, while, while this is going to address many of the problems we're seeing, because it does help those companies who have concerns about sharing because they don't want to obviously be sued by their customers, this will help that. It's not going to help everything. There's still a lot more to do in the cyber world to ensure that you know, both consumers and enterprises and governments remain secure because bad actors are way more motivated and you know, they're, they're getting more sophisticated every day. You know, you mentioned Neiman Marcus and Michaels. I was hoping we could kind of drill down a bit on perhaps hypothetically, if these bills pass, if it becomes law, how does that apply to the next big hack? How does that apply to the next Anthem, the next Sony? What would this actually do in those scenarios to help those companies either mitigate or prevent uh, these type of big hacks that we're seeing, or would it not? Well, I mean, again, usually information sharing is helpful, but um, there's nothing that's going to prevent it, an attack except that enterprise or that entity having up-to-date security software running all the time and making sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. I mean, obviously, it's helpful. We share information every day with our competitors, with other companies, with the government, and tell them about what we're seeing. They tell us about what they are seeing. Um, but it's information sharing is not going to prevent, I should say, is most likely not going to prevent the next big attack. Most of the time, we, as we've seen with a lot of these um, high-profile breaches, someone is already on the system. Someone's been there for years exfiltrating the data. It's just that they, they hit something a little different this time that made an alarm bell go off. So again, you know, while I think it would be very helpful, because again, information is power, and that goes just with anything, not just cyber. The more you know, the better you can protect yourself. But the question is, will you actually protect yourself? Will you actually take those proactive steps?
to make sure your networks are secure. So I think it's just continuing to highlight the importance of, of the issue and the importance of having great cyber hygiene and you know up-to-date security. We have time for a couple other questions. So I, one I, I have a question for Dina about uh, hygiene, uh, <laughs> functional, functionality and practicality. And you talk about the need to be up-to-date uh, does up-to-dateness and understanding you have the current uh, software mean that you find out through some kind of hack that there are vulnerabilities? How do you, how does that, I don't understand. Well, there's two ways. I mean, obviously, everyone who knows, you know, we have Patch Tuesday with your Windows. And, uh, you know, you want to run your patches, don't ignore them, don't keep saying, remind me in two hours or two days or two weeks. That's obviously something that's important. Usually you don't find out that you've been breached until you see, you know, for a consumer, you either see that your credit card data, or your bank data is not the way you thought it was, or um, your computer is doing something interesting, like if you are hit with ransomware and your computer is frozen up and you're asked to pay some crazy amount of money so they can give you back control of your computer, uh, you usually don't find out until, you know, a lot of your data has already been exfiltrated. So it's, again, it's being proactive, making sure you have strong passwords, you have up-to-date endpoint protection, behavioral-based blocking, so you can figure out what the, what the threats are doing. That's how we find out about a lot of things. You know, we follow the threats, we look at the patterns, we look at what it does, we look at where it goes, and that's how we prevent against them. So it's just a matter of, you know, patch management, Educating yourself, don't click on the link if you don't know who it's coming from, even if it looks like it's from a Facebook friend. That's one of the constant things that we see. Um, you know, the basic things that you would think of, you know, just if, if you were locking your windows, you know, you leave your house, you don't leave your door open, so don't leave your computer with 1234 as your password. Well, uh, isn't it true that some of the companies that were hacked were actually, they discovered it through something like a blog? Uh, yes, and that, and that unfortunately is the case. And, and unfortunately, I don't, um, I can't speak for any of those companies. But sometimes it is um, after you've already lost in a, a significant amount of data, do you find out you've actually been breached? And I think that goes to another area, more in the data breach realm and notification versus um, strictly information sharing. Because again, this is a very broad cyber ecosystem that we're dealing with, but. Um, I think companies are aware of the importance um, for companies, they need to be able to patch that vulnerability, patch that hole before making a lot of these notifications. So there's a lot of steps that go into securing your networks and devices. None of your organization is able to afford a, a robust um, cyber defense capability. Um, and so they're forced to go down that path of either uh, risk transfer versus a risk acceptor risk so would either one of these two um, bills be able to support the carriers being able to have access to that shared data such that they can see those attacks and those indicators of compromise as they're coming across the wire? So when you say they can't afford, so say a small mom and pop business, right. cupcake shop? Right. Well, the example mm -hmm. with Windows XP. I mean, right. there are cases to upgrade and there are some cases where Windows XP is just fine. Well, I'd also say there are cases that you know, you need a risk-based security suite based on, you know, what your business model is, what your data is. And there are a host of security, there are free security products. I believe Microsoft has freeware. Uh, I think Dell may have free products that is, it's basic endpoint protection and what we think of as antivirus. Um, but I, I don't think this bill is going to make anyone, you know, bolster their security suite, but I, I think and I take, I take a little bit of issue when people say we can't, they can't afford it because you can get many of these products either for free or for maybe you know, $50, $60 a year. And when you look at the cost benefit of one single attack to that business, that could put them out of business versus spending you know, $50 to renew your, your endpoint protection. So I, I think that again, it's a choice for a lot of businesses. Um, you figure, why should I invest that? You know, if, if it ain't broke. But usually it's broke. <laughs> the, 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 the more of the question was to how does AT&T, Verizon, and the carriers get access to that threat data so that they're seeing the indicators of compromise before they They, they, they see point. data today. I mean, they are very, uh, every, every telco is very uh, 
baked into the information sharing realm today, they see everything. So they see probably more than my company sees, and again, because they have a, a broader reach. At this point, I have clients who live in that space, and they do. They have extensive um, insight into that, and they use that to protect. If you use Comcast or whatever system you use, they take what they find and protect you. You don't even know it. And they're using it on the system to protect you. And that goes to some of the countermeasures and yeah. defensive uh, measures that we're talking about. Okay, well, we just passed one o'clock, but I'll allow for one more question here. <laughs> you're talking a lot about information sharing. So what I'm hearing, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that what, what you're talking about right now is this robust sharing of information amongst private sector entities. There seems to be this assumption that sharing with the government is going to create some sort of Bonus. What do you guys think about that? Um, you know, I'd say we're again we're sharing with the government today. I think a lot of these bills um, actually do assist with actually getting real time information from the government to the private sector, and that's what really we're trying to facilitate. At least most of our companies, because again, like you cited, sometimes we don't find out about certain things until they're in Fed Blog or the Washington Post, and that doesn't help us protect our customers. So not only do they help facilitate private to private sharing and private to government, but it also facilitates government to private sharing, which for us is, is very important because that obviously gives us a more a, a larger picture of what's going on. And the whole point on a lot of the bills is the real time sharing, which is the speed in it. Because if we wait a week to give you information, it's too late. But a day, it's too late. All right. Um, well, thanks to our panelists uh, for joining us and. Uh, Educating us on the subject. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> so, one quick announcement before we head off. Um, the next briefing of the Net Caucus will be on May 1st on the Patriot Act, uh, which, as we mentioned, sunsets soon. Uh, Washington Post's Ellen Nakashima, a great journalist, will moderate. Uh, John Oliver from HBO was not available for the panel, but the general counsel from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, Bob Litt, will be speaking in this room. May 1st. Uh, RSVP at www.netcaucus.org. Thanks, everyone.